Uh, also, Jesse has no idea I'm going to say this, but uh, it's really important you guys all know there's 66 days left until Christmas. And yes, I work in retail. So come do your shopping with us, please. Uh, farming and agriculture is the theme today, and I, I just looked up a, a couple of quick fun facts I wanted to share. There's In Massachusetts, there's over 7,200 farms. Yeah, there you go. The mass agricultural industry provides employment to approximately 26,000 individuals and produces an annual market value of $475 million. Family and individually owned farmers account for 79% of all Massachusetts farms. Female farmers represent 38% of all principal owners. Yes, there you go. And bringing it down closer, in Franklin County alone accounts for the largest percentage of farms in Massachusetts with 830 or 18% of all farms in Massachusetts. And farming and agricultural revenue in Franklin County generates a staggering $68 million annually. So the farming and the agricultural communities cannot be overstated. So I want to thank the panel today for sharing your story because our community would not be the same without you in it. So thank you. And I'd like to welcome and invite Jim Alexander up from the Greenfield Cooperative Bank. There you are. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I have several pages to get through. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Greenfield Cooperative Bank, I want to welcome you all here. We're proud to be the sponsor of the Farming and Agriculture um, Chamber Breakfast this morning. When our bank president, Tony Warden, asked if I could stand in for him, um, I first, of course, asked him, really? Um, and then I asked him, what was, what was the topic? And when he mentioned that it was farming and agriculture, um, you know, I told him, perfect, uh, because it really is. Um, I grew up in a different Franklin County in northern Vermont, where, similar to our community, it has a, has a strong heritage and legacy of local farms. So I'm familiar. Many of my friends were dairy farmers. My grandmother ran a dairy farm in Quebec and then in Coventry, Vermont. So I understand the challenges and how difficult it can be to navigate in today's environment. And we need to support and understand our, our farming and agriculture community. So um, I, I, guess, I guess with that, because there's more important speakers here today, I'd just like to say that Greenfield Cooperative is very proud to be the sponsor this morning. And I welcome you. And I turn it back over. Thank you, Jim. And I'm so glad to hear that you made your way to the best Franklin County. <laughs> uh, we are so grateful for the support of Greenfield Cooperative Bank. Um, as you know, we had the opportunity, many of us, to attend a great Greenfield Cooperative Bank community event here in this very room last night. So thanks very much to everyone who could have just stayed over but still made the effort. <laughs> we are so glad you're here, and you're going to be glad you're here too because today's breakfast is one for the record books. We obviously have a full crowd today, which I should have known. Farming was going to pull in the folks. We had to add a table, which is a great problem to have. I love when we have to do that, but we have, it's because we just have fantastic speakers. We have a great program. We have wonderful sponsors. We have fudge. <laughs> and most importantly, we have Franklin County native Commissioner Ashley Randall in the house today. <laughs> Ashley is straight off a flight from Chicago. She was at the World Dairy Summit. So if you were thinking about complaining about having to travel from Terrazzo's home and then back to Terrazzo's again, don't complain to Ashley. Um, this is not Ashley's first breakfast, but we do have a number of folks who are celebrating their first breakfast with us today. So please wave or stand when I call your name. 
Welcome to Derek Morrison and Kyle Bostrom from Greenfield High School. Welcome to Trisha Wanko, who is the Massachusetts Agriculture Innovation Center Director at the Franklin County Community Development Corporation. That is a lot to fit on a business card. Good job. Our friend and office mate, uh, Laura Trudeau, is here from Historic Deerfield Museum Store. Is Laura here? All right, we'll give her a clap. Tamsin Flanders is joining us from the FERCOG. Hi, Tamsin. Welcome to Peter Alberto from Greenfield Savings Bank and Samantha Taft from Greenfield Cooperative Bank. And then Meryl Latronica and Will Kleinsteiber are joining us from Just Roots. We've got a solid Just Roots crew here today, so welcome. And then welcome to new member Rich K. Lane of Abacus Benefits Plus. And then we'd also like to extend a big director size congratulations to the Google of Franklin County, and that is Jessica Atwood of the Franklin County Regional Council of Government. She is the new director of planning there. And then also to Otis Wheeler, who isn't here today, but he is the new interim executive director at Greenfield Community Television. So congratulations to you both. All right, and now that we've all got you here, we do want to make a few quick event announcements. Um, so first and foremost, Franklin County Community Development Corporation, I'm looking at John because he just told me about this, is having their annual meeting on November 16th at the Gateway City Arts in Holyoke. Everyone's invited. Everyone's invited. So we should go to your website to register for that. That's right. We will do that. And then next, Scarecrow in the Park is back this weekend in Bernardston. So you should go to Sweet Lucy's. And then you should cross the street and go over to Cushman Park because there's going to be food and crafts and music and, of course, dozens of differently themed scarecrows, all of which are outstanding in their field. Right? It's October. It's time for scarecrow jokes. The 2003 Fall Public Safety Festival is scheduled for Saturday, October 28th from 3 to 8 at Sunderland Elementary School. That event will feature more than 50 local agencies, music, food, trucks, safety demonstrations, and a costume contest, and a helicopter. So the safety demonstrations didn't sell you, the helicopter should. And that is a really great family event we've been the last couple of years. It's fantastic, so check that out. And then, of course, Franklin County Cider Days is right around the corner. Cider Days, as we know, takes place the first weekend in November each year. Um, please visit ciderdays.org for a full list of participating vendors and activities. And then last, I got an email late last night. I, I don't know that I have approval, but I, I think this makes sense. Um, that Stone Soup Cafe is looking for about 12 to 15 volunteers to help deliver meals tomorrow afternoon. So is Kirsten here? Oh, good. So if you are interested, if you have some time tomorrow afternoon, please talk with our friends at Stone Soup Cafe. We would really appreciate your help. There are so many events happening that is just the surface. So please check out our website. We try to keep our events calendar updated. That's franklincc.org. If you know that's of something that's happening and you don't see it on our website, let us know. We'll add it. We're good like that, right, Marion? We try. <laughs> So now we are moving on to the program. We are going to focus, as we as we said today, about agriculture and farming and its economic impact, not just in Franklin County, but across the state. So I'm grateful for Wade for sharing those um, statistics because I do think it helps frame the discussion. Franklin County is home, as we said, to more than 830 farms. That Those statistics are from the 2017 census, so I imagine those are actually up. But farming and agriculture is more than just a critical economic driver. It really is a literal life source. Farming truly free feeds our economy. We all see the bumper sticker, no farms, no food, and that really sums it up. Our farmers are heroes. And I say that as someone who comes from a long lineage of farmers, and also as someone who grew one tomato one time. <laughs> it was 2020. I put my heart and soul into that plant. I got one tomato. Had there been the fair at the time, I would have entered it. I was so proud. 
But all of that to say that agriculture and farming is a challenge in the best of times, let alone what we've seen over the past couple of years with the drought and the flooding and everything that our farmers who are really on the front lines of climate change impacts are facing. So I just also want to say that I am so grateful for the work of our community partners at CESA and at the Franklin County CDC for their support day in and day out. Farming is tough. This is not an attempt at a pun, but it's easy to be siloed. And I appreciate their work and helping us really weave together an incredible agricultural community. So can we just give a big thank you to CESA. To acknowledge the Healy Driscoll administration, and obviously that includes Commissioner Randall, for their quick work in spearheading the Massachusetts Farm Resiliency Fund um, right when things got really tough this summer. They, they moved, mobilized, moved into action. I know Phil at CISA was a big part of that statewide commission. And together, we all raised about $4 million. So thanks to everybody who helped answer that call for funding. Uh, I believe that they've already put that into action and we're already supported more than 200 farms in Western and Central Massachusetts. So that money is already hard at work. And that is just not only for now, but for the longer term, we're really trying to build resiliency. And we couldn't talk about that without also acknowledging Senator Joe Comerford, I think Elena's here, um, Representative Natalie Gway, uh, Director of Rural Affairs Ann Gobi, and all of our state and local officials who made sure that farming and agriculture was also a consideration on the state budget side. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> so if there is a silver lining hidden somewhere in this summer, it is that we are really so lucky to be part of Franklin County and so fortunate to have such incredible, hardworking local and state officials and community partners who patch together support on a multiple levels for our farmers and our agricultural industry folks. So today is really a celebration of that support. Um, and I'm so grateful to you all for being here. Thank you. So without further ado, please help me welcome the first female commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, South Deerfield native, Ashley Randall. Good morning, and thank you to Jesse and Wade for taking all of my talking points. <laughs> I, I think I can think of a few other things to talk about and highlight today. And I will just start by saying that I know this is not the February I Love My Job breakfast. But it's safe to say, I think I have personally the best job in the world. I am so grateful for the opportunity to work and advocate on behalf of our farmers, not only the ones on the panel, but in the room, I see several farmers as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here this morning. I know time is incredibly valuable on the farm. And certainly this year with the weather challenges that all of our farms have experienced in Western Mass and across the state. As Jesse mentioned, I am a proud Franklin County native. I grew up on a fifth generation dairy farm in South Deerfield and continue to stay actively involved on the farm. And what I will say is growing up, I really took for granted that there is only one Franklin County in the state and how truly special Franklin County is. As Wade had mentioned and Jesse, this is really a critical part of our agricultural economy in Franklin County. Franklin County ranks number two in the state in terms of economic impact, second only to Worcester County. And when you look at the land, the land mass of what that means, that's extremely significant. Over 800 farms in Franklin County contributing to the local economy and crops such as vegetable production in Franklin County being number one in the state, dairy being number two statewide. So very significant and surprisingly, aquaculture being number three statewide. And you may be thinking, how in Franklin County are they ranking number three? Well, a little known fact is the largest protein producer in the state is located in Turner's Falls at Astralis, where they produce barramundi and trout inside their facility. 
And that's also something that we're seeing more of with climate resiliency is indoor production and season extension and how we can weather the challenges that have been presented, especially this year. And so I will say that growing up and getting to see agriculture in the state and how it's changed, the numbers speak for themselves. But one thing that's always remained constant is the community support for agriculture. And I think that's what makes Franklin County so special, is we have consumers that want to buy local nutritious products from local farms. We have farms that are committed multi-generations to being a part of the fabric of the community and making sure that their neighbors have access to food. To have a harvest supper that was started 13 years ago, 19, excuse me, 19 years ago, to bring the community together to provide food for anyone in the community that wants to have access from our local farms, all of the food that we have in abundance in Franklin County. I think that's really special. And I also think the network of organizations we have in the room today is incredibly unique and special, providing those support services to our farmers to make sure that they can not only survive, but thrive for years to come. And I will say that consumers all have their favorite products, whether it's sweet corn from a particular farm, or they have an agricultural tradition of their first pancake breakfast. And in Franklin County, that's really become part of agritourism, as well as supporting the local economy by going to those farms year after year. Just a little anecdote, and I mentioned to Ben earlier, a few weeks ago, my mom started calling me and she said, does Clarkdale have their cider yet? And I said, mom, I don't know. I haven't been to the farm. I haven't talked to Ben. And so she went, they didn't have the cider. And then last week, she called me three times in a row when I was in a meeting. So of course I was concerned. So I stepped out of the meeting and I said, hi mom, is everything okay? Clarkdale has cider. And I said, Thank goodness, and you would have thought the holidays had arrived early. She was so excited, and I'm proud to say last night when I was in Deerfield, there was cider in the fridge. <laughs> but it's just those stories that I continue to hear, and that's just one example. And that's just a personal connection to agriculture in this community, but things that we look forward to every year. And I will say to Jesse's point earlier, we're also very fortunate where we're at a place right now where we have leaders in place that are very supportive of our agricultural community. The chamber and everything that the chamber does for the community. We have Senator Comerford and Representative <laughs> Blay who are tirelessly advocating on Beacon Hill for farmers in Western Mass and making sure that their interests are heard and well served. And I'm incredibly grateful to them for their partnership because I wouldn't be able to do what I do at the department without them in terms of the services we provide to farmers, new program development, and funding for the Natural Disaster Recovery Program, which was allocated in a very quick fashion through the Senate President and the legislature and signed by the governor to be able to help farms in need from the freeze, frost, and flood events this year. I'll also say that I'm very fortunate to have a boss and the governor and the lieutenant governor who are supportive of farms and agriculture. And I think not even in their first year, we've already seen that demonstrated on multiple levels. And part of that is just showing up. And I think that's incredibly important. And the recognition that they're in the fields and they're listening to the farmers and their stories and I'm able to join them and hear directly from farms so we know how we can help ensure that the agricultural community remains really strong in Western Mass. And I don't wanna take up too much time because I'm truthfully really excited to hear from all of the other panelists and my friends on the panel. Fortunately, I can say I know all of them very well and it's great and really an honor to be on this panel with them today. So I will just end by saying that it really does take all of us to make this agricultural community so strong in Western Mass and in Franklin County. And I wanna offer 
my sincere thanks to all of you for all that you do to make agriculture strong. And with that, I will turn it over to my friends on the panel and thank you all very much. Thank you, Commissioner Randall. Um, and it, it should also be stated, I know I mentioned before, but Commissioner Ashley Randall is just an integral part of advocacy at the State House and then also making sure that policy changes that affect our agricultural community are productive. So can we give one more round of applause for Ashley? And she doesn't even let jet lift, which is the most impressive of all. Um, so next we have Margaret Christie from CISA. And again, I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you to CISA for all of the work you do. I sleep better at night knowing that we have CISA in our community. So I'm excited to hear from Margaret today. Thanks so much, Jesse. I like being responsible for someone's good sleep. <laughs> that's, that's really good. Um, and I really want to thank everybody for having us here. This is a great gathering and a really wonderful panel to be on. I agree with Ashley that I'm honored to be part of this. So as Jesse said, I'm Margaret Christie. I'm the Special Projects Director at CESA. CESA stands for Community Involved in Sustaining Agriculture. We strengthen farms and engage the community to build the local food economy. Our offices are right down the road in South Deerfield, and we work in Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin counties and do some statewide work with partners. And we feel like we have you know, an enormous amount of overlap with all of you in this room in terms of our mission and goals. We're all concerned with building a thriving local economy. And I also think that the challenges that farms are facing and local food businesses are also many of them really shared by other businesses in this room, um, things like supply chain disruptions and the challenges of attracting and keeping skilled workers, um, the rising cost of many of the things you need to do business. And also, obviously, farms are particularly affected by weather and climate change related disruptions, but I think increasingly other businesses are seeing the impact of you know, road closures or rain every weekend and those kinds of things. So I think we have um, a lot in common. So CISA's flagship program, I hope you all are familiar with, um, Be a Local Hero, Buy Locally Grown. I hope you've seen our bumper stickers and our signs. It's a business membership program. There are several members here in the room, and the members include farms, retailers, restaurants, institutions like schools and hospitals, um, specialty foods producers, so really anybody who's growing, sourcing, and selling locally grown food and farm products. And they are listed in our on-farm, we have an online guide, so it makes it easy for customers to find those businesses. We do lots of promotion, and we have a very visible shared brand, which has two benefits. It makes it really easy for people to spot what's local and to choose that, and it allows businesses to sort of have a shorthand to say, we support the local economy, we support local farms, we support open space, and you can be part of that by participating in this campaign. So in, to that, in addition to that promotional work, we provide a lot of training and technical assistance to farms and food businesses. I'm going to just give you a few examples because it's a really wide range of topics, but people come to us if they need to write a business plan, if they need to improve their financial record keeping, if they want a new website or a new logo, if they're trying to figure out some kind of labor regulation that has them stumped or a food safety requirement, um, all kinds of things. And we can provide in-house support or we can consent, connect them to a consultant and often we can pay for the time of that consultant working on that farm. In the last couple of years, we've added a full-time climate change staffer who's helping farms adapt to climate change. And as several people have already mentioned, that work has really been front and center for us this year. We've had three very significant climate and weather related disasters this year, which had a huge impact on production and caused millions of dollars in damage. And as people have already said, the response from individuals and the local community and the state has been really tremendous. And I am hopeful that we, we will look back on 2023 and we will say that was a terrible year, <laughs> but we put in place some systems and networks that we're now relying on as we see these disasters more and more often. So we'll feel like, okay, that was really bad, <laughs> but we figured some things out and, and we're using those things now. And I think farms are left feeling this 
kind of odd mixture of like a really an enormous amount of gratitude to the community and a lot of uncertainty still about how you know they are going to continue to farm in this increasingly unstable <laughs> climate. Um, I want to mention one other aspect of our work which has to do with food access. We run the Senior Farm Share Program, which pays farms to provide a share of the harvest to low-income seniors. We support about 500 um, senior farm shares through that program, and we're planning to double that in the next couple of years. We also do a lot of work helping farms and farmers markets um, participate in the Healthy Incentives Program, which is a state-run SNAP rebate program that if you're a SNAP recipient and you use your SNAP dollars on local produce from a participating farm or farmer's market, you can get a rebate of that money right back into your SNAP account that you can use for other SNAP eligible expenses. It's a great program, it supports farms, it supports people who really need food, but there is some um, you know, bureaucracy and technological challenges um, that we are really happy to help people with. Um, I want to point out that on your table you have materials about our um, resilience campaign. We are working to build our capacity to make sure that farms can keep farming and growing food for all the rest of us. Um, and I think the COVID-19 pandemic in many ways exposed both some of the best and some of the worst of our food system. On the local level, farms did just a tremendous amount of work to make sure that they could still get food to people who live here, despite the fact that the normal channels for doing that, you know, as you all know, were completely disrupted. And that they had a level of sort of nimbleness and ability to figure things out much faster than our national and global supply chains. And we are going to need that more and more as we see more disruptions due to climate change. So we really need to foster that. At the same time, COVID-19 revealed very long-standing inequities in our food system and in injustices um, related to who does what work and what the working conditions are and you know what they're paid. A lot of those things are tied to systemic racism. So our goals in our resilience campaign are to keep farmers farming, to make sure that everybody has access to really good, healthy food, and to make sure that we're doing everything we can to address those injustices. So I encourage you to look at those materials. Um, I want to um, end by talking about the importance of partnerships to us. We couldn't do the work we do without really great partnerships, and many of those close partners are here in the room. And I know that's really the reason we're all here, is to figure out what we have in common, and which is lots, and how we work together to achieve those goals. So to that end, Wade and Jesse did a great job talking about the economic value of local farms, and I know you all, all know, and Ashley <laughs> told some good stories to remind us of the really great food that farmers produce. And I want to point out that in, or, in, other, in addition to those values, um, farms are also really responsible for a lot of the attributes of sort of quality of life and the beauty of this region that benefit all of the rest of us and other businesses and attract great customers and great employees who want to live in this region, partly because it's beautiful, we have great food, and we have great you know, activities and things to do on farms. So I want to encourage you all to return that favor and you know, do what I know you're already doing in terms of supporting farms, appreciating the seasonality of food, the story that Ashley told about Clarkdale cider. I will admit that I have made my own call to Clarkdale to find out <laughs> when is the cider coming. And for me, that is really one of the joys of living in Franklin County is that it is very easy for us to have that connection to the seasonality of food, which brings us a connection to this land and the people who live here. And that is not available as easily as it is here in many, many other places around the country. If you travel in strawberry season and you feel like, I need strawberries because it's strawberry season, <laughs> it's, it can be really hard to find them. And similar, you know, you could tell that over and over. So for me, that's one of the really great pleasures of living here. And if we don't support it, you know, we won't keep that, as, as you all know with all local businesses. So thank you so much for your support, for coming together to talk about this. Um, and for listening to these other really good panelists following me. Thank you, Margaret. Um, such great work. 
CISA is doing. We are so grateful. And I do want to acknowledge that Rep. Natalie Blay has joined us. She did miss me saying all of the nice things about her. So you're going to have to tell her after the breakfast. But thank you for your advocacy. We are so grateful for your work. So next we have Angie Facey, who is the owner of uh, Breezy Knoll Farm and also part of the our family farms um, milk in it's a co-op so i'm sure you all are familiar with our family farms milk they did just release a new chocolate milk which everyone must try um, but i had the opportunity to visit angie at the farm in leiden a couple weeks ago with uh, congressman mcgovern's farm tour and i can tell you the only thing more impressive than their creamery operation is the names of their cows <laughs> every single one of those ladies has a unique name and personality and so i think it's important to know that while you are sipping on chocolate milk you may be enjoying milk made by tabasco gorgonzola or miss ignition funnel cake which i think <laughs> makes milk taste that much more fun so welcome angie Thanks, Jesse, and everybody else for coming this morning. So just to clarify, we didn't name her Ignition Funnel Cake. <laughs> the, the, the name on the top of the tag is the sire's name. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how are they coming up with this? Yeah, that, that's, that's a little bonkers, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, welcome. Um, <laughs> Yes, we do name all of our cows. Um, it's kind of a fight sometimes at the farm. Who gets to name what calf? You know, if it's a brown Swiss, that's my sister-in-law or, or my nephews. If it's Holstein, you know, we, we, uh, we duke it out. But yes, we, uh, we know every cow by their name and we care for them like they're our children. So, except the children are always there. The cows, you can go home. <laughs> So I grew up on a dairy farm, but unfortunately it was in <coughs> Wilfrid <Wolfsburg> County. <laughs> um, I grew up in Spencer on a 90 head milking cow, um, Holstein registered farm, and my parents milked, um, they were first generation, and um, they, they milked 90 cows in a um, four, double four herringbone parlor, and they did everything themselves. Um, we, we all worked together as a family. Um, every weekend wasn't really a weekend because you're always working. <laughs> um, Christmas morning, you know, you have to milk the cows before you can uh, do your family stuff. So anyways, um, so I guess it, it bred a love in me for cows because that is my passion. And my passion is also to educate consumers about um, the nutritional value of milk and farming in general. Um, I met my uh, husband, Randy, and I can't even remember, <laughs> 2002, right, and when we got married in 2004, we actually bought my parents' herd, and then we combined his family farm with my herd in Leiden, so um, I, the day I met him, I was like, wow, I'm never, never moving to Leiden. <laughs> Surprise, I've been here for 19 years, so. <laughs> but I still feel like a transplant, like, because I don't know half the people in our town, so. <laughs> but anyway, so right now we're milking 120 cows on um, two Lely robots. So we um, purchased the robots in 2019, like right before the pandemic started, and we got started up in December of that year. So um, the, the robots are amazing. They're a, li a life changer for us. So we get more data on the cows because they have a transponder on their um, collar. And so we, I can get um, activity, I can get somatic cell when she goes in the robot, I can get fat, I can get protein, rumination to make sure she's eating. So we're not necessarily milking the cows every single day, but we're getting all this data so that we can manage the cows so much better. Um, so everyone's like, oh, well, you're not milking cows. But Technically, I'm milking cows right now. <laughs> so, um, I am co-owner and operator of Breezy Knoll Farm and Our Family Farm, so that may be a little confusing, but Breezy Knoll is the, the dairy farm and Our Family Farm is a cooperative. So, um, it started in 1997, and there was about eight dairy farmers that got together and said, we need to do something to earn more for our efforts. Um, selling milk on the wholesale market just doesn't really cut it anymore. 
maybe in the 70s, but um, it hasn't been great for the last couple decades. So, so they got together, they got this brand together, they had a segregated route, the milk truck would come to um, all eight farms, and then it would go to Southwick Dairy, and excuse me, Pioneer Dairy in Southwick, get bottled, and then shipped out to stores in Western Mass. So everything was great um, until they decided to sell the business and there was some unfortunate things, so we weren't able to buy that business. So we had to go somewhere else. Um, so we ended up going with Guida's and our milk was not segregated anymore. And it was still um, made by family farms and it was still um, benefiting us, but we couldn't say it was all of our milk. So it took us 26 years, but finally on April 5th of this year, we opened a creamery on our dairy farm. Yes. <laughs> if I look like I haven't gotten sleep in a while, it's because I haven't. <laughs> so that was, you know, we're like, hey, we have a dairy farm. We work really hard. Let's add another business that's really hard too. <laughs> so um, that first night, we worked until probably midnight. Um, just trying to get milk out the door to stores the next day. And we celebrated with cereal at the end of the night. <laughs> um, and then we started up again the next morning. So it's, um, the, the thing that we're fortunate about is that milk is not seasonal. We milk all year round, so milk is available all the time. Um, it is seasonal in the sense that less people, you know, you drink less milk in the summer and you use more milk in the, the winter and the fall. But. Um, so we're always available. <laughs> um, the creamery has had many challenges. We, I mean, we had already had the brand for 26 years, so we thought, wow, this is amazing. We're just gonna, you know, take off running. But we've had to figure out, you don't homogenize heavy cream, who knew? <laughs> so we had lots of issues with it being too thick or too thin, but we were fortunate that we live in Franklin County and we work with um, some of our members and we were able to bring the cream to them and have them work with it and say, yes, this is working great for my recipe. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> or no, um, I need to put, it needs to be thicker um, for a Boz's Alfredo sauce. So, um, but we were able to come and do that. You know, you can't do that with a lot of other businesses like that, so. Well, I'm happy to say it's perfect now. <laughs> <laughs> <Phew. laughs> We, um, by opening the creamery, we were also able to uh, add to our product line. So we only did gallons and half gallons for many, many years. So now we're able to do half and half, which I didn't even think about bringing this morning. My apologies. <laughs> Heavy cream, um, chocolate milk, and we're working on strawberry milk next. That'll be out in like two weeks. And eggnog. And does anybody want to guess the name of the eggnog cow? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Grinch. <laughs> she was born around Christmas a few years ago, so that's why she got the name. So, so if you look at our bottle, um, if anybody has one, those are our cows that someone actually drew. So every fat variety has a different cow, or different, every product is a different cow. So cola is on the chocolate milk. That's my nephew's cow. Guinness is on the whole milk. Um, she was born on St. Patrick's Day, so, you know, that's why we, we use that. She was um, actually my son's first 4-H calf, which traces back to one of my first 4-H calves, so it's kind of special. He doesn't think so, but I do. <laughs> um, there are so many ongoing challenges, like labor. Um, we have enough labor, but it seems to ebb and flow. Um, we aren't selling enough milk to, um, to use all of our labor, is what I, I really should have said. So if we could sell more milk, then our labor, our labor would be more efficient. So, um, so we're kind of stuck in that little, little spot right now, but we're, we're working on it. So sales have started to, to climb this fall because kids are back in school and everyone's back in the routine. And um, so we're drinking milk, so keep drinking milk, please. <laughs> and coffee. Um, oh, and think, speaking of the half and half, if you get a little blup, when you pour it, it's because it's real cream. I have so many people, okay, 50% of the people say, ew, it's curdled, and then 50% of them say, yes, it's real. <laughs> so there's no preservatives, there's no additives, it's just straight from Leiden. <laughs> so the little plop is okay. Um, 
I didn't even mention that uh, we'd gotten a food security infrastructure grant to help build the plant, but unfortunately we started building when it was uh, at the height of the inflation and uh, lots of issues, of course, around that. But um, So we had to buy brand new equipment. And with the brand new equipment, coupled with our extremely clean raw product, the milk on the dairy side, um, we're getting 25 days code on our milk. And that's almost unheard of, so we're really proud of that. <laughs> Most people get about 18 days, so so that just means it can sit on the shelf a little longer. But you know, when you look at the the shelf, people go for that you know the the the, old, the, new, the newest or the oldest day is what I mean, you know. But honestly, if you open um, a container that's dated today, October t uh, 20th, and you open a container today that's dated November 12th, which is the code we put on the other day they will spoil at the same rate. That's something that most people don't realize. So you can't open something that's dated November 12th today and have it good on November 12th. <laughs> so, but anyways. Um, so lastly, what Jessie had written in one of her emails was, put your money where your mouth is. So um, dairy farms are like economic powerhouses. We can't do business with Amazon. You know, I do business with many of you in this room. Um, and we employ local people, we keep local space open, um, we, we do a lot for the community that sometimes isn't necessarily realized. So next time you're going to buy milk at the store, it's maybe a buck more, like they say on the commercial, but <laughs> it's worth it because you're, you're keeping our family and um, everybody that we work with in business. So thank you. Thank you, Andy. I think that's a really good point. So obviously we're all here because we believe in supporting locals. So please reach out to your local connections, find out how you can support them. Uh, CISA on the website has a really great tool that says find local. So please visit the website and, and search um, if you're looking for something in particular. But where else in Franklin County is there an eggnog cow, right? That's right. <laughs> So next we have Michael Nelson, who's the president of the Franklin County Agricultural Society. He also wins the award for the most support letter requests, which we are happy to write. They usually come in like after 10 p.m., um, which I appreciate, but that it just speaks to how many hats he wears. And in addition to everything else he does, he also manages one of the oldest continuously running fairgrounds in the country. So. He is a force. I am grateful for the work he is doing to um, build and transform the fairgrounds inside and out. So please help me welcome Michael Nelson. Jesse, you're the reason page three exists today. That's the um, all the grants that you've helped us receive this year. So we're going to go through that later on uh, this morning. Um, but thank you everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I am the president of the Franklin County Agricultural Society. We are the organization that owns the Franklin County Fairgrounds uh, right here in Greenfield. Uh, the fairgrounds came out of a group of very inspired farmers and agricultural enthusiasts back in 1848 who said, we're doing a lot of great work here in the community. We should be building each other up and helping us build this powerhouse farming economy. And so all of these wonderful farmers like Angie and Ben Clark and such got together and said, let's have a fair. And everybody can bring together what they have, what they're making, show it off. People can learn from each other and uh, we can really grow our economy with uh, the stuff we're already doing. It was the OG trade show of, of <laughs> agricultural planning uh, back in 1848. If you're doing the math real quick, that's 175 years. Um, so we are very excited to have our 175th fair this year, this coming year in 2024. Um, of course, it should have been last year, but 2020 happened, that existed. Um, but nevertheless, um, even 175 years later, we still have an amazing agricultural commitment at the Franklin County Fair. Um, I have some quick numbers to, uh, to rattle off. Um, this year at uh, the Franklin County Fair, we had 29 horses, 55 oxen, 260 cattle, 92 of which were shown by youth exhibitors, 387 sheep, of which 59 were from youth exhibitors, 40 rabbits, of which uh, 17 were youth exhibitors, 
uh, 105 poultry, of which 20 were youth exhibitors. Um, and of course, I say all those numbers not for anybody to keep track of, but really to take that key point that agriculture exhibition is still a key component of the fair and a major part of um, bringing the agricultural community together at the fair. Uh, we also had over a thousand exhibitors um, in the roundhouse. We should have had a thousand one, but uh, Jesse's tomato didn't yeah. survive that long. <laughs> so we'll look forward to seeing that next year at, at, at the roundhouse. So looking forward to that. Um, so with the deep roots that we have here in our community um, and our 175th year coming up, um, my board this week voted on our theme this year, which seems so fitting for everything we're talking about this morning and our role in the, fair, uh, the fairgrounds uh, with the agricultural community, and that is rooted in our community. Um, so all of our uh, folks who are very deep into, <laughs> deep, deep into the agricultural <laughs> landscape, um, we certainly encourage you to continue to be part of the fair. Uh, we'll be having an exciting um, theme with uh, all sorts of, uh, I'm sure our poster is going to be very deep on, deep again, deep into the whole group concepts. Uh, but it really is a uh, reflection of our long history and our deep commitment to the agriculture of the community. Uh, we certainly recognize how valuable the fairgrounds are to the farmers, exhibitors, and our economic tourism. Um, as we continue to expand the fairgrounds programming, um, we are uh, really prioritizing our agricultural prior, uh, uh, commitment. Uh, well, we have the Franklin County Fair, which brings in thousands of people. We also have plenty of other shows that take place, including uh, goat and cattle shows. Um, the 4-H, uh, 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 you may need to help me with this. What is your mom's show? The State 4-H, State 4-H cattle show takes place um, each year at our fairgrounds, so and we're proud to continue to do that, as well as the other um, agricultural shows. Um, Investment in our facility is critical uh, with the amount of people that are coming to it, the amount of farms that are participating, and the hundreds and now thousands of exhibitors that I was just mentioning a moment ago. Um, it's important to continue to build this fairgrounds into a facility that can continue to be uh, uh, very receptive to our community and continue to build. So if you happen to be at the tourism breakfast two years ago um, when we met here, uh, you heard me speak about the ambitious plans we had for revitalizing the fairgrounds. Um, after several years of uh, some deferred maintenance and some uh, unfortunate weather events that caused a uh, really tough financial situation, uh, we really fell behind on, on our work there. Um, but I'm thrilled to say all the goals that I shared two years ago, we have achieved. Um, thanks in part to our legislators, which uh, I know Natalie's here and I believe Elena, I don't believe Joe's here, um, and the countless support letters that I have received from our colleagues in the room, um, we have a whole bunch of new things, which are amazing, and these are huge to help propel the fairgrounds and the ag community into the new future. This includes fully paved walkways. If you uh, went to the fairgrounds a few years ago, you'll remember the potholes, the cracks, um, the literal danger you put yourself into to walk around the fairgrounds. Um, we are now fully paved, front to back, full of ADA accessibility to everyone. That right there, in, its, in a nutshell, is like humongous. <laughs> LED lighting inside and out. We've minimized our impact on our environment, created a safer facility, and really highlight everyone who um, is exhibiting at the fairgrounds. We have a fully stabilized facility. So you may recall a few years ago, the fairgrounds was literally collapsing into wetlands below. Um, with the support of the USDA and our legislators and legislators in the room, we have fully solidified that embankment. It is no longer collapsing. The fairgrounds are stabilized. We've planted over 100 trees, and uh, we have revitalized and protected the adjacent wetlands. Beautiful, beautiful sight now. For those who exhibit or participate in any of the buildings, um, you may recall how hot the buildings could get. You would open a window, but you couldn't close it. Or you would close the window and you couldn't reopen it. Uh, we now excitingly have windows that open and close in all buildings, which is very exciting. Um, it was very fascinating. As we were trying to like measure the windows to put new ones in, not a single window was, was the same. What we ultimately figured out was that our, friend, our old Yankee farmers 
found literally any windows that were in the basement and built these buildings because literally nothing matched. <laughs> it, was, it was quite amazing. Wayfinding signs, um, through the um, uh, Mass Office to Tourism and in conjunction with the City of Greenfield and the Mayor's Office, we were able to get up wayfinding signs on 91 and Route 2. So now people can find Franklin County, they can find the Franklin County Fairgrounds and see all the exciting stuff we're doing here. Uh, we have public Wi-Fi across the fairgrounds, so now uh, vendors can accept digital payments. We're obviously in a very digital world now. Um, I myself don't carry cash um, and was struggling to be able to buy stuff at the fair. Um, now you can uh, accept all digital payments at the fairgrounds. Um, included in that, we now have a POS system uh, that at the front gates and um, at, the, um, at our various uh, booths that allow us, the fairgrounds, to accept uh, credit card and digital payments. Site-wide pi site -wide public communication system so we can provide real-time messaging to the public, both the good and if, God forbid, there is ever bad stuff we need to communicate. And a restored roundhouse. Um, the roundhouse is famous for so many reasons, one of which, of course, um, is right as you walk in, you will always see the beautiful, um, very extravagant displays by Clarkdale Farm. Um, and so the roundhouse is quite literally the gem of the fairgrounds. Um, and one incredibly important thing that we've been working towards, as I uh, noted a few minutes ago, was the ADA accessibility across the fairgrounds. Um, we're really excited that we received a small grant from the um, um, AARP um, that we are supplementing with some match funding. And as of Tuesday of next week, we'll now have a stair chair in the roundhouse that will allow everybody access to the second floor of the roundhouse. Um, we, we have guests who have never been up there. We have guests who used to always go up there and can't anymore because they've reached a certain age, they can't do the stairs. Um, this is something that we've been really enthusiastic about and we are excited and cannot wait for the, um, the ribbon cutting. I actually have, I purchased giant scissors, Jesse. Oh, so when we do, I know you love ribbon cuttings. Yeah. So when we, when we cut the ribbon on that, I'll be sure to have you join us for the scissors. I'll bring a confetti cannon. Absolutely. We do. I did not get confetti cannon, so that's good. <laughs> so these dramatic improvements, um, allow us to continue to be the premier gathering space for our agricultural, uh, community. Um, as well as the arts and entertainment um, within Franklin County. Um, our, the clear community for the fairgrounds really inspired all of us. We're an entire volunteer team, myself included. We all do this. We all participate on this board because we love agriculture. We love the Franklin County Fair. And we love bringing our community together. Um, shameless plug, we're always looking for more people to join said board and the members, so feel free to join us. Um, we're thrilled to continue to uh, do this work, especially as we enter our 175th year. Um, we certainly encourage everybody to be part of it. Um, your work makes us stronger, and we're proud to highlight the critical work that you're doing here in Franklin County. Um, in 1880, 1848, the Ag Society was, was formed for the sole purpose of promoting the agriculture and promoting everybody in our community who's doing that hard work, and we're really excited to continue to do that as we do so not only um, in our 175th year, but in our gorgeous, rehabilitated, and ADA accessible new fairground. So thank you for everyone. Um, just a few years ago, we were barely scraping by. Now we have an amazing facility that's going to bring us into the new generation, and we're so thrilled. Um, a lot of people made a lot of donations. Um, a lot of people in this room made a lot of donations to help us get to the place we are right now, and I can't thank you enough. Um, everybody should be proud of what we, where we've accomplished, because COVID was really a tough situation for everyone. Um, and not only did we survive COVID at the fairgrounds, but we have invested over $1.3 million in 18 months, which is unheard of. So thank you everyone for your work. We appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. And I do think it's important to know he did bring it up, but I mean, the amount of time that those volunteers dedicate, I am partial my friend Mary Noga in the back is on the board. Caitlin, so many folks. So thank you, Peg. Thank you very much for the countless hours that you dedicate to making that um, those improvements possible. So now we have Laura Fisher from Just Roots, and I had an opportunity to visit Just Roots a couple of weeks ago with the United Way, and I was blown away by the programming they're offering. They are doing so much work to make sure that fresh, locally sourced food is available to all of our neighbors. Um, I was so impressed that I walked away with a sweatshirt and a farm share, and I know that after you hear Laura speak, 
you too will want a sweatshirt and a farm chair. And good news because we have one available at the raffle today. Today's raffle is really good. So stick around. I know we're running a little long. We're going to speed it up. Um, but we, you will be impressed. Good morning, everyone. I will keep this pretty short just because I know we are nearly at time already. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself first and talk a little bit about what Just Roots is. My name's Laura Fisher. I'm the executive director at Just Roots. We're a nonprofit community farm right here in Greenfield, seven minutes away from here if you want to come visit. I grew up on a farm in East Hampton. I grew up on a fourth generation family farm founded by Polish immigrants. My maternal grandmother grew up here in Greenfield, one of eight children of a single divorced mother. So I'm so happy and I feel so blessed to be leading this organization. I've been with Just Roots about a year now and I am just so thrilled to be part of all that we're doing and to talk to you about it today. So who is Just Roots? Just Roots is, as I said, a nonprofit community farm right here in Greenfield. And we are unique in that we are driven by a philosophy that fresh local food should be available for all budgets and for all of our neighbors. Maybe you know us from coming to the Greenfield Farmers Market or our Thursday afternoon pop-up outside of Rite Aid, which is very popular this year. Maybe you came to our seedling sale this spring or you attended a workshop on our farm. Maybe you saw us in the Pride Parade or maybe you're already a member of our CSA. We do have a farm share with us already. For those of you who don't know us, we hold a long-term lease with the city of Greenfield. We cultivate on a dry year, about seven acres, on the site of the old Greenfield Town Farm. We also rent to other small local producers and growers, including Sage Farm, who has some pastured pork with us. We run a very robust CSA. So for those of you who are not familiar with the CSA model, it's the farm share model but we're unique. Our CSA membership this year, locally, was 500 members this summer. And that's a really impressive number, but what's more impressive is who in our community is receiving those farm shares. We are one of the largest SNAP enrolled CSAs in the Commonwealth. Half of our members are otherwise fully subsidized through grants or healthcare partnerships. And we deliver farm shares both locally in Franklin County, as well as up and down 91 through those healthcare partnerships. So we are serving not just Franklin County, but we also reach Hampshire and Hampton counties. And that's been really exciting to expand and build on. We also function as a local food hub. We provide markets to other local growers and producers. This year, nearly three quarters of a million dollars of our budget is slated to flow through to other local farms. This is thanks in part to a wonderful grant from the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources that's helping us to prioritize this work. We support over two dozen other local farms through buy-ins for our programs, including farms run by some of my fellow panelists. Because of our food access philosophy, these dollars stay local while helping to feed more and more of our neighbors. We believe that if we invest in our soil and the land we steward, we build the wealth of our community. We build the wealth of our locality. We contribute to our community's well-being. So thank you to all of the panelists here today who helped us this year and who are helping us to build a resilient, diffuse, diverse, local food economy here in Franklin County. And if you haven't visited Just Roots already, come visit us. That's my challenge for the next year. Go to justroots.org, come tour our farm, come check out our events. We're right down the road and we love meeting our neighbors. Thank you all so much for being here this morning and I'll turn it back over to Jesse. Ben, please take her up on that offer. It's amazing. I went and whatever the produce is of that day, they also have a recipe so that you know how to use it, which is really helpful um, because I didn't realize that I don't know all of my vegetables until we visited and I had no clue what it was. 
Um, so please stop by and visit. So next, it is my honor to introduce someone who needs no introduction, but he does possibly need a superhero cape. So Ben Clark, not only is he the owner of Clarkdale Farms and the world's best cider, right? Um, but he's also the assistant volunteer fire chief for Deerfield. And there has been two times this summer where I've heard that Ben Clark single-handedly just happened to be in the right place at the right time <laughs> and was able to help save someone. Um, one of which was when someone was trapped in their car and the road literally washed out from underneath them. Ben, of course, drives around with a life jacket in his truck and so was able to jump in and save Another time we were at a press conference for the Massachusetts Resiliency Fund and someone passed out and guess who caught her? <laughs> ben Clark. Which leads me to wonder, is he pushing people? Like what are the chances? <laughs> so without further ado, Ben Clark. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much, Jesse. And uh, yes, you might want to avoid being with me. <laughs> um, and I and I am very very thankful. Jesse had already picked up apples, which um, if there are any left, please grab some. Um, and thanks to Buzz for for sharing. Um, but also that I brought the cider because I think it would have been uh, really in trouble if I didn't. So <laughs> Ashley gets a jug to take home. So. Um, no, but thank you, and uh, and thank you for having me here. And, and also, Wade and I did talk this morning, and uh, we, we both wore our pink shirts, so um, it's good to coordinate. Um, so our farm has been around since 1915. Um, I'm pleased that my parents, Tom and Becky Clark, are here as well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm the fourth generation, um, and I think the, the Margaret spoke really really well earlier about the challenges of farmers, um, and we definitely um, weren't alone as a fruit farm. Um, everyone knows, hopefully, the peaches were lost, um, apples were severely damaged by uh, frost, um, you know, the rain was a, certainly a big challenge for us, um, but um, on the bright side, we have a retail operation, and um, the great thing is, being a fourth generation farm, um, we have a great uh, connection with the community, and a lot of you here, you know, as as has been said, are customers, um, and um, you know, we feel as as a community business, um, I learned from my father of giving back, uh, you know, fire department on the chamber board, other things, um, and all of you here, uh, give back to the community, and the community will support you. Um, and that's something that's that's really true. Um, we, if we were a wholesale operation, which there are some farms um, still in the state uh, orchards, um, you know, the damaged fruit that we had this year, or the lack of a crop, um, you know, there's not a lot of options. I mean, we are thankful, as Ashley mentioned, um, uh, the the commissioner, the, the Department of Ag, as well as the governor, lieutenant governor, um, our reps, um, uh, Natalie and, and Senator Comerford. Uh, really supportive of farms, and that's something that, that we do recognize and we really are thankful for. Um, but, you know, we can't just rely on, on government aid. Um, you know, we really have to have the community support, which is something that we really feel, um, and, and we're really thankful for that. Um, you know, even with a reduced crop, people are really coming out. Um, we help each other. I have Angie's milk in, in, our, in our fridge. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's a thing of if if you give back to the community, then the community supports you, and I think that that's really true. You know, businesses here today, um, and uh, I think that's a it's a good summation of agriculture. Um, but uh, we have the same challenges: labor, weather, um, as a lot of people. Um, but we try to be positive and and get through. And farming, you never know what the year is going to bring. So um, we try to be positive, and and I think it's you know worked out so far. Uh, <laughs> resiliency, I think it's great. CISA, you know, I was very involved with CISA as well. Um, and, uh, you know, the great things that CISA's done in terms of really promoting local agriculture and what our farm has, has benefited along with others um, in terms of the buy local movement and really leading the, the state and the nation. Um, and, and I think that it's just a wonderful thing that all of you are here today too. So um, I appreciate you coming out and uh, turn over to Jessica. Thank you. And thank you to all of our speakers today. I know we're running a little long, but I do think it is really important that we have this topic so that we're able to really remind ourselves how critical farming and agriculture is to our economy. So a couple takeaways. One, raise your hand if you think farming is important. 
Excellent, great. And now I want you to take that hand and high five a farmer today because they <laughs> need our support. Yes, thank you. Um, find a way to help support your local farms, whether that's at a farmer's market, again, using that great tool on the CISA website, supporting CISA with their Grow Resiliency Fund, um, doing agro-tourism, Mike's Maze, any way you can, please help support our local farmers because the self-sufficiency and you know, the food security that they cultivate is critical, critical to our economy. So, and after you do all that, then you can register for our November 17th breakfast, which is gonna fix, feature films in Franklin County that is sponsored by Greenfield Garden Cinemas. Is Isaac still here? I think he had to go to court. Uh, Greenfield Gardens is a, <laughs> usually he has to run off to go to court at night. Um, and then also Gilmore and Farrell. And we will have a red carpet at that event. So come ready. And where is it? It's at Greenfield Community College. Yes, so that's. Can we wear gowns? We, we, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> so I think that sounds great. So that's going to be fun. Please register. You do get the discount if you do that early. And we will make sure there's enough tables if you do it early. Okay.